So the, uh, the topic of use in Bello is the second part of, of just war theory. <clears throat> uh, last time we discussed use ad bellum, which are the six principles that uh, we, that uh, comprise reasons that justify the use of force. Uh, and we noted that uh, the use of force should be a last resort and, should, and force should only be used in self-defense or in the protection, for the protection of innocent others. Uh, once, uh, use the, uh, once the use of force has been deemed legitimate and justifiable, then we turn to the question of its right conduct. That is, uh, if we are, are justified in using force, uh, are there any limitations or any guidelines for the actual conduct of that force? And as it turns out, there are, there are, um, there are particular guidelines, both moral guidelines, and those moral guidelines have also been codified uh, into law, into international as well as national, national law. So that's the topic of uh, abuse in Bello. I might add at this point that both sets of principles, use ad bellum and use in bello principles, are uh, these principles offer us uh, reasons. They provide us with reasons as kind of tools uh, which we can use as citizens to either consent to uh, our government using force and its right conduct of that use of force, or we can use these uh, principles to dissent um, from our government decisions to use force or the right conduct of force. Um, so these are important principles that empower, empower us uh, to either consent to our government's actions or to dissent protest, uh, uh, call out uh, that the uh, government is uh, misusing its power. So these are important, uh, I believe, important principles. So um, as noted, the uh, use and bellow principles are, are principles or norms that regulate or should regulate the right use of military force. They're often also referred to as the war convention, sometimes we often referred to as the war convention. And they, that, these principles as the war convention uh, often uh, uh, under, are the foundation for the rules of engagement, uh, rules that are applied in various engagements of the use of force by the military or police forces. There are, are Every time uh, force is used, uh, there are rules of engagement that are specified for those uh, using that force. And the uh, principles of use in Bello inform, in many cases, those rules of engagement or should, uh, should inform them. The assumption here uh, is that there should be limits uh, to the use of force. And this, uh, that, uh, uh, force shouldn't be used uh, um, without limits. Uh, and this refutes the war, so-called war is hell doctrine, the doctrine of total, uh, of total war. That is the idea that has been practiced often that uh, warfare is, uh, is lawless and amoral, that uh, when you engage in warfare, then anything goes. The principles of use in Bella are attempt to put limits, uh, moral and legal limits on the use of force. And therefore, uh, when uh, they define these criteria, define what a war crime is. I'm, I'm sure you've often heard of the idea of war crimes uh, and war crimes are defined in terms of the violation of the principles of, uh, of use in Bella. There are two, uh, two basic principles uh, that provide the normative criteria or the normative guidelines for the use of force. Uh, the first principle is discrimination. 
the principle of discrimination. In this, in this context, discrimination refers to non-combatant immunity. That is, the use of force should, should not be intentionally uh, aimed at innocent uh, non-combatants. That non-combatants, that is non-military uh, actors, uh, innocent bystanders, innocent civilians, uh, should be immune from any harm, even in the context of warfare. Um, discrimination uh, mainly, therefore, uh, prohibits the intentional harming or killing of innocent non-combatants. Um, therefore, the uh, military or the police force it has a moral obligation to protect as, far, as much as possible the um, non-combatant non civilians. And this gives rise to uh, questions of who counts as a non-combatant, uh, who is an innocent civilian. Um, often, sometimes the lines are blurred in terms of who is a non-combatant. Like for example, uh, are uh, worker, workers in a factory uh, producing military weapons or ammunition during, during war, are they non-combatants or are they combatants? Would it be um, a war crime to bomb the uh, factory when they are, are working, um, et cetera? So discrimination, the principle of, of discrimination uh, is aimed at guaranteeing non-combatant immunity. The second principle is proportionality of means, and that is the, uh, there should be a proportionate degree of harm done to combatants uh, relative to the good achieved. In other words, uh, proportionality of means uh, is a limit on the uh, a limit on excessive force. It prohibits the use of excessive force. So you, if you can achieve the military ad objective without, uh, uh, without dropping a nuclear weapon, um, an extreme example, then you, you, should, uh, you shouldn't drop the nuclear weapon or you shouldn't carpet bomb the, uh, the, inst the military installation if you can achieve the goal by other less harmful means. So proportionality is, uh, is a guide to, uh, to reduce the harm by reducing uh, the ex excess of, uh, of harm done. So it requires that we use that military uh, personnel, officers, soldiers, also police forces use proportionate force in, the, uh, in, in conflict. So those are the two principles of use in Bella, uh, discrimination and proportionality. In part, they are both the principles of um, use ad bellum and the principles of use in Bella are uh, based upon a uh, foundational uh, moral principle, which is referred to as uh, the principle of double effect. And the principle of double effect reads as follows. Uh, the foreseen evil effect of a man's action is not morally imputed to him, provided that one, the action itself is directed immediately to some other result. The evil effect is not willed either in itself or as a means to the other result. And three, the permitting of the evil effect is justified by means of proportionate weight. Um, so the principle of double effect suggests that although the use of force is, uh, is not a good, it's not, whenever force is used, it's, it's not good. But uh, even though it's, it's not good, it can be, uh, can be justified uh, per, to protect uh, others, to protect oneself and to protect others as well. 
and that uh, that protection uh, is the main intention and the um, the harm done uh, collateral to uh, to that main intention is permissible uh, or justifiable even though it's uh, it's harmful so that's uh, the principle of uh, double effect. A second overriding uh, principle is the Nuremberg, what is called the Nuremberg obligation. And this obligation was recognized at the Nuremberg tribunals in, in, in Germany after World War II, the trial of uh, Nazi war criminals. And uh, uh, the main uh, uh, defense at Nuremberg by the Nazi, uh, Nazis was that we were just following orders and the court did not accept uh, that, uh, that excuse or that, uh, that justification for uh, violations of discrimination and uh, violations of proportionality, as well as violations of uh, use ad bellum uh, principles, uh, the crime of aggression. And the Nuremberg Court uh, ruled that there is a moral duty to disobey un unlawful orders. Um, that the plea I was following orders is not not a legitimate justification. So since Nuremberg, this uh, and this has been codified into law, and is practiced uh, throughout the world uh, by militaries, is that uh, you uh, the if one is given a unlawful order, for example, if one if one is given an order to kill innocent civilians. One has a moral obligation to disobey that uh, that order from one superior. And that's the uh, Nuremberg obligation, and that 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 moral duty to disobey unlawful orders is grounded in the the two principles of discrimination and uh, proportionality, the use and bellow principles. So there are uh, prominent cases of uh, that apply to use in bello that apply use in bello considerations. That uh, one case, one uh, uh, historically important case is the bombing of cities. This is per, uh, uh, rampant in World War II. Uh, there, uh, on both sides of the war, there was continual bombing of citizens and the continuing continual killing of those citizens through military force, uh, both violating the principle of discrimination as well as proportionality. The case of weapons of mass destruction, um, also the, uh, the use of weapons of mass destruction are both nuclear, biological, chemical weapons are uh, always indiscriminate. They will always harm uh, innocent civilians on a massive scale, and they are uh, generally clearly disproportional in terms of its harm. So weapons of mass destruction from the perspective of these principles uh, should never be employed, um, and perhaps one could argue should not exist at all. Uh, their existence may be uh, immoral in it in themselves uh, based upon these these principles so these principles suggest that certain weaponry may be dis both discriminate indiscriminate and disproportional and therefore they should be, their existence should be banned or at least their use uh, use should be banned and and that's occurred uh, throughout the history of warfare that certain very harmful and disproportionate weapons have been uh, ruled to, their use have been ruled to be illegal and immoral. A third type of case here is the use of torture to extract uh, military intelligence uh, from captured soldiers and others. And uh, the use of torture also, by, once a, a, a combatant is, um, is captured, that combatant is no longer a combatant. Uh, the combatant becomes, the soldier becomes a non-combatant and therefore it is, uh, it is wrong, it is immoral 
uh, to torture them, to extract information from them. Um, and this, this is codified uh, in, in law uh, in the Geneva Conventions by treaty that the use of torture is illegal and uh, immoral. Uh, during the uh, Bush administration, during after 9-11, the Bush administration argued, for example, that uh, the use of torture was uh, justified. Uh, it was a part of the Bush doctrine, was justified uh, to gather uh, intelligence uh, from uh, captured uh, Islamic uh, jihadists. Uh, the argument from the Bush administration was that these jihadists were not combatants uh, and therefore did not fall under the uh, provisions of the G Geneva Convention and therefore torture, using torture was uh, justifiable. I think that's a very shake, that was a, a very shaky argument at the time and remains shaky to this day. Also, uh, drone, drone strikes, uh, the use of drones, um, that is un, a drone is a un, unmanned, if you will, uh, aircraft that uh, can deliver powerful missiles at, at, with a certain precision, uh, a certain amount of precision. Uh, so it's better than bombing from 30,000 feet in terms of discrimination uh, not and non-combatant immunity. However, drone strikes generally in their use have, uh, have uh, resulted in uh, the deaths of many non-combatant bystanders uh, to the strike. And so that uh, the use of drones uh, have, uh, have become controversial. The idea of terrorism itself, a third kind of case, uh, terrorism, the act of terrorism is a, can be defined as the intentional, deliberate, deliberate targeting of innocent civilians, uh, targeting them for death or harm uh, in order to put pressure on, uh, on their governments to change their policies. And by, by definition, therefore, an act of terrorism is, uh, is immoral and illegal because terrorism violates the principle of discrimination or the principle of non-combatant immunity. So those, uh, um, those cases, those uh, issues uh, illustrate the, uh, how uh, the principles of non-combatant immunity and proportionality are, uh, are used uh, to think about uh, the use of force, the right conduct of force. We now turn to a, a case that I would like you to, uh, to discuss and analyze um, this morning in, in your small groups. Uh, and let me uh, outline that case. And this is a real case, uh, a real person and real decisions were made regarding that person. Um, and it has to do with uh, an American citizen by the name of Anwar al-Awlaki. Uh, he was uh, a natural citizen of the United States, uh, or in this uh, in this scenario, he is uh, an American citizen born in the United States, uh, grew up in the United States. He became uh, uh, radicalized uh, in terms of his religious faith, and he began to preach and had a, a very large uh, internet following uh, within the United States, but around the world. And he began to preach and to openly call for armed jihad against the United States. Um, he called for terrorist attacks against the United States. He, call, he, he called on uh, Muslims within the U.S. military to attack other soldiers, um, et cetera. So he, uh, for years, he uh, attempted to incite, uh, to incite violence. Uh, while he was inciting violence, uh, he never himself engaged in any terrorist or attacks or other acts of direct violence. 
So while he incited violence, he never engaged in any directly violent acts. So um, we have an intelligence, military intelligence, that uh, he will be driving by car, riding by car on a road at a specific day and time in Yemen. So we have identified, we know that he's going to be at a particular location driving on a road at a particular time. Um, and your charge in, in this exercise, you are, you are asked to advise the president, in this case, it was President Obama, uh, advise the president, you're one of the president's advisors, uh, and uh, you are charged to provide a recommendation and a justification regarding the question. Uh, uh, and there are two basic options here. Should we, should we send a special operations team uh, to capture him on that road? We know where he's going to be at what time. Should we deploy a special operations group uh, to capture him and to bring him to the United States uh, to face indictment and and trial in a US court. Or uh, the second option is should uh, a lethal drone strike be authorized? Uh, should, we, uh, should we kill him with a drone strike? We have this capability. We can uh, drop a, a missile, uh, precise missile on his car. He will be driving, we know he's going to, there are going to be other people in the car and we know his, also his son is going to be in the car with him. Uh, and his son is about 15 or 16 years old. Um, what course of action would you recommend? What course of action is morally and legally right? Uh, and some of the question, uh, question to consider is, is it right to take the life of an American citizen without due process of law in the interests of security? Also, would it, is it justifiable in terms of the principles of discrimination and proportionality? Um, is Al-Awaki a combatant? Is his son a combatant? Is this a proportion, well, which, which, uh, which is more discriminatory? Um, which option, capture or death, is more discriminatory and more proportional? And also you could consider the Constitution's fundamental guarantee of due process in your deliberation. So uh, you're, I'm asking you to make a recommendation and uh, construct a justification using the principles of discrimination and proportionality as well as uh, due process. You don't have to all agree in your group, uh, uh, if there is disagreement, you could share both sides or both decisions and whatever arguments you can uh, make to justify your decision. So your, your charge is to uh, re make a recommendation, should we capture Milwaukee or should we authorize a lethal uh, strike against him? 